Welcome everyone to today's webinar on Millikan's Compression Training Academy. We will be covering Module 4, Wound Management Principles with Compression Therapy. This is the fourth module of six in series. Follow-up information will be shared after this webinar on the dates and times for the upcoming modules. On behalf of Millikan, thank you for joining us. Before we begin, we'll touch on some housekeeping. Today's webinar will begin with the presentation followed by a question and answer session. Questions can be submitted at any time during the presentation by clicking on the dialog bubble icon with Q&A noted and entering in your questions. This webinar is being recorded and will be made available after the event on the Millican Healthcare YouTube page. If at any time the slides stop moving or audio stops, exit out of the Microsoft Teams live event and rejoin. Please submit any technical questions that you have in the same Q&A icon dialog box as we are here to help. Millikan & Company is a family-owned U.S.-based organization in business for more than 150 years. With expertise in textiles and chemicals, Millikan's healthcare division was formed with innovative products and technologies focused around improving patient lives together. Millikan Healthcare offers a variety of products and technologies, including a compression products range called CoFlex TLC. CoFlex TLC is offered in two layer compression kits designed to provide optimal compression. These compression systems come in variations based on the activity level of the patient, as well as the desired compression or pressure range. In addition to the CoFlex TLC compression, Millikan Healthcare offers advanced wound care products developed with moisture management in mind. These offerings include Tritec wound contact layer dressings, ultra foam dressings, and agile gelable fiber dressings. With that, I am pleased to welcome today's speaker, Claire Stevens, Millikan's clinical nurse specialist. Thank you, Claire, for being here today, and I will now turn the floor over to you. Welcome to Millikan Healthcare Compression Training Academy, a series of educational modules intended for healthcare professionals caring for patients with venous leg ulcers and complications of the lower limb who require compression therapy. Welcome to module four, wound management principles with compression therapy. This module will focus on leg ulcer related wound challenges, clinical considerations, aims and objectives when selecting dressing materials for use beneath compression therapy to optimize compression wear time, reduce bandage failure and improve patient outcomes. This module will cover an introduction to leg ulcers, a recap from previous modules exploring the size and costs of the leg ulcer problem globally, wound and skin care considerations when managing wounds and protecting the skin beneath compression therapy, differential diagnosis, exploring the different clinical presentations, aims and objectives relating to different leg ulcer wound types when considering appropriate dressing materials, wound presentation and history, identifying historic challenges and evaluating the response to previous treatments. Tissue types, we will look at the World Union of Wound Healing Societies, definitions of tissue types and explore appropriate treatment regimes. Exudate levels and types, we will look at the World Union of Wound Healing Societies and Wounds UK published descriptors of wound exudate volume indicators and explore appropriate treatment regimes able to manage different scenarios. Infection prevention and management, bio burden and infection. We will explore the fine bio burden balance on prevention and the identification when management intervention or the use of antimicrobials is required. Dressing principles. We will look at the ideal dressing characteristics, dressing categories and explore different dressing types. Skincare principles, preventing peri-wound skin breakdown and managing general skin health beneath compression.
In preparing this presentation, we have used and relied upon information from public sources on the web. We therefore make no warranty expressed or implied as to the accuracy or completeness of the underlying assumptions, estimates, data or other information not generated by Millikan. Compression therapy is considered gold standard treatment for the management of chronic venous insufficiency, venous reflux and associated conditions, including edema, venous leg ulceration and skin conditions such as venous eczema. The goal of compression therapy is to support the underlying venous system and structures, aid venous competence to improve venous return, reduce limb edema, decrease pain and increase leg ulcer healing rate. Compression therapy will be required for life to prevent chronic venous insufficiency and symptoms of venous reflux from recurring. Module one of this education series contains in-depth information on the causes of chronic venous insufficiency, the venous system and its structures, the veins, the valves and the calf muscle pump. Venous leg ulcers are a global healthcare challenge. The United Kingdom estimates prevalence between 0.1 and 0.3%. The United States of America, approximately 1.69%, with similar prevalence rates reported in parts of Europe. The annual cost of managing confirmed venous leg ulcers in the United Kingdom is reported to be between 500 and 900 million pounds. The United States of America estimate annual costs between 2.5 and 3.5 billion dollars and are consistent with European estimates, with Germany reporting cost to treat at between 9,900 and 10,800 euros. These figures continue to be challenged. Erwin et al. in 2022 report lower costs in the United Kingdom through continual prevalence and reporting methodologies. The cost to the individual patient and impact on their quality of life is impossible to measure. Recurrence rates are reported to be between 26 and 69% at 12 months post healing. There are a plethora of evidence based policies and guidelines available which have been designed to establish a global consensus approach toward leg ulcer management and selection of compression therapy, including the International Advisory Panel for Compression, who published a pathway cited in the European Wound Management Association compression documents. Wound and skin care considerations for managing leg ulcer wounds beneath compression therapy. We will look at each of the following categories in more depth during this module. Differential diagnosis. Venous and mixed leg ulcers present themselves differently and as such have different wound dressing selection challenges. We will revisit differential diagnosis shortly. Wound size, shape and location. These factors will impact the types of dressing materials, for example, not to create bulk or pressure points over bony prominences beneath compression. The dressing size is available for larger, even circumferential wounds and the ability to accommodate irregular shaped wounds. Wound duration, frequency and responses. It is important to understand the wound history. What episode of wound is it? What is the reason for recurrence, deterioration or improvement? It's important to know previous dressing history and response level to treatment, any allergies and acceptance to treatment by the patient. Patient experience is very important. Some patients will refuse certain dressing materials based upon a painful, odour or leakage experience previously. Tissue types. 
Good wound bed assessment, recognising all tissue types, understanding treatment aims and objectives in order to make appropriate dressing material considerations. Exudate level. This has been a subject of a great deal of discussion and research over the decades. Disparity exists in the indicators used and descriptors to determine and document accurately the level of exudate. We will explore the World Union of Wound Healing Societies and Wounds UK published descriptors. Management of exudate is a key challenge, particularly with the venous leg ulcer. Selecting the correct dressing material to cope with copious levels of wound exudates and also being able to reassess at each clinical visit as the chronic venous insufficiency or underlying bioburn can alter wound exudate levels very quickly. We also need to prevent desiccation and adherence of dressing materials causing wound bed trauma upon removal. Exudate type. We will explore the World Union of Wound Healing Society's descriptors and definitions of wound fluids. A key consideration is viscosity and the ability of dressing materials to absorb viscous fluids. Bioburden. Recognising the signs of colonisation, critical colonisation, wound infection and biofilm is very important, especially so due to the antibiotic resistance. Recognising when we should use antimicrobials for early management and prevention, particularly in those who have recurrent infection history, aiming to prevent the need for antibiotics. Understanding how the biofilm scenario differs, its presentation, its diagnosis, which is difficult, and the additional antimicrobial challenges and needs biofilms pose. Skin care, the peri wound, maceration, excoriation and adhesive skin stripping. The importance of selecting the correct barrier and dressing materials to protect the peri wound skin barrier function. We need to keep excess wound fluids, particularly chronic wound fluids, which can be very harsh to the skin, away from healthy intact skin, and to use dressing fixation methods and other dressings that do not have harsh adhesive compounds. The skin. It is also important to look after the skin of the whole lower limb. Aim to avoid dryness, prevent or immediately recognise and treat eczema, avoid skin trauma, observe for potential allergy, contact dermatitis and explore for dressing, cream, ointment, wash sensitivity and document allergy history. Differential diagnosis venous leg ulcers. Venous leg ulcers are usually accompanied by moderate to severe levels of edema. Located in the gaiter area of the lower limb between the ankle and the mid calf and are often large wounds with multiple other satellite wounds which often join and enlarge the main wound. It is not uncommon for venous leg ulcers to become circumferential or wrapping themselves completely around the limb. The wounds are usually shallow with irregular, gently sloping edges. Venous ulcers are often longer duration wounds or chronic and may contain several different tissue types, granulation, viable and non-viable, slough, fibrin, and are known to exude moderate to high volumes of wound fluid. Chronic wound fluid varies considerably in colour, consistency and microenvironment, which can be destructive to the skin and inhibit cell proliferation. Infection is very common in venous leg ulcers. Pseudomonas is particularly prevalent. Due to wound duration or the chronicity and levels of fluid leakage, these wounds often tip from colonisation to critical colonisation and then into clinical infection and have a tendency to develop biofilm, which are very difficult to treat and often infection reoccurs. These patients are also high risk of developing cellulitis. 
Pain is often associated with excessive swelling from the edema, inflammation or infection and treatment options. Pain is usually relieved through limb elevation. Differential diagnosis, mixed leg ulcer. Mixed leg ulcers are usually located at the ankle and the lower aspect of the gaiter region with mild to moderate volumes of edema. Wound size and shape is variable, often smaller and deeper than the venous ulcer. The wound edges are rolled, smooth with a semi-punched out appearance indicative of the underlying arterial insufficiency. The limb and wound tissue is pale and prone to developing devitalised tissue, slough and necrosis. Wound fluid levels are lower than that of the venous ulcer, usually low to moderate levels, and infection is also common. Whereas patients with venous insufficiency gain pain relief through limb elevation and arterial through allowing the limb to be dependent or dangling downwards, the patient with mixed disease is unable to relieve the pain with either method. Wound size, shape and location, considerations when selecting dressing materials. As we have just discussed under differential diagnosis, venous leg ulcers tend to be larger, higher exuding wounds, which can be challenging and costly to manage if inappropriate dressing materials are selected. Whilst mixed leg ulcers tend to be lower exuding wounds due to their underlying arterial component and have their own set of challenges and clinical needs, which are different to those of the venous leg ulcer. Wound size. Larger wounds, as normally seen in the venous leg ulcer, have the potential to become circumferential very quickly compared to the mixed leg ulcer, which are smaller, punched out areas. Each poses different wound dressing challenges. Whilst the care of all of the limb skin is fundamental beneath compression for both leg ulcer types. Multiple wounds may be of close proximity which can be very challenging to dress, especially if different dressing materials and actives are required in close proximity. Wound shape. Some irregular shape wounds can also become very challenging to dress with some of the standard available dressing shapes and sizes. Wound location. Considerations include gravity, pressure, friction and shear forces and the bulk of materials. Conformability of dressing material is crucial to accommodate areas such as the ankle, the malleolus, curved areas of the limb to provide a smooth surface for the compression to be applied. Potential to enlarge the wound areas due to surrounding skin conditions, both dermatological such as gravitational or venous eczemas and exudate management particularly chronic wound fluid creating further skin breakdown and skin excoriation. The most common causes of non-healing or enlarging leg ulcers is the failure to manage wound exudate effectively and the failure to recognise and diagnose and treat eczema. Wound duration and responses to previous treatments. Ulceration episode. If the wound is new, a first episode or a first confirmed diagnosis, treatment choices are started relating to assessment criteria, which we will explore shortly. If, however, the wound is recurrent following a previous healing episode, there will be a wealth of history relating to responses to previous dressing treatments deployed. Duration. How long has the wound been present? Leg ulcers have been reported as active wounds in some patients for many years of duration without ever healing. We will look at revisiting diagnostics in these circumstances shortly. We know increased wound duration results in chronicity. Changes to the wound biochemistry, such as pH imbalance, bio burden requiring management to correct the biochemistry and provide the optimum balance for cell renewal and healing. Improving or deteriorating. 
As we progress through the patient's journey, we should consider what is working or not working at each dressing change and what the potential causes of any wound stasis or deterioration, as well as the signs of improvement. Are all the diagnostics and assessments up to date? Ankle brachial pressure index, duplex, full blood counts, bio burden status. Despite all patients receiving compression therapy, having diagnostic and assessment procedures undertaken prior to treatment initiation, these and any additional procedures should be revisited if wounds fail to progress as expected. This is underpinned by the concepts of wound bed preparation and time, and more recently, TIMERS, the revised published document. Responses to previous management strategies and treatments. Some patients' wounds may not respond as well to certain dressings as expected. Again, we should revisit diagnostics at this point. Compression therapy may also be better tolerated by some patients better than others. Patient factors, concordance or compliance to treatment. If the patient removes the dressings, the compression or does not follow other wellbeing advice, which is covered in module five of this training series, the outcome will not progress as desired. Patient factors within general medical history, which may affect progression, stressful life experience that correlates with changes to the wound, such as a bereavement or job loss or stress affecting the patient's wound healing process. Tissue types. The correct wound bed assessment and identification of different tissue types is essential to ensure the correct dressing materials are selected to achieve the wound healing objective. Tissue type identification and management strategies therefore critical to successful healing outcomes. The following tissue type descriptors, clinical presentation and recommended management is published in the World Union of Wound Healing Societies document. Necrosis or eschar usually presents as black or brown. It can be wet or dry. The management strategy is that of debridement with the exception of being ischemic and or diabetic lower limbs and feet due to decreased blood flow, minimal tissue being present over bone and the ability to effectively renew tissue. The aim is to remove devitalized tissue, reduce the risk of infection and allow cell renewal to occur. Slough usually presents as yellow green cream. This can be wet or dry with varied tenacity. The management strategy is that of debridement. Different debridement methods will be discussed shortly within this module. The aim is to remove devitalized sluffy tissue, reduce the risk of infection and allow cell renewal to occur. Granulation tissue. Healthy granulation tissue usually presents as red and uneven textured strawberry jam like in appearance. Beware of the beefy red, which may be indicative of unhealthy bio burden granulation tissue requiring a different management strategy, such as antimicrobials. Management strategy for healthy granulation tissue is that of protection of the newly formed tissue with fragile young capillaries and cells. Moist wound environment to aid cellular turnover and prevent desiccation. Epithelial tissue usually presents as pale pink white dots within the wound or at the wound edges. Management strategies that have protection of the fragile new cells and maintenance of the moist wound environment to allow cells to migrate over the wound prior to complete healing. Hematoma, which is a collection of blood clots, sometimes covered with a thin layer of skin. Management strategy cited in the World Union of Wound Healing Societies is that of debridement using larval therapy, monofilament fibre pad or hydrochels. In some cases, if a hematoma is extremely large, posing a high infection risk, surgical evacuation may also be performed. Tendon or ligament. 
usually yellow and shiny unless it's been allowed to dehydrate. Management strategies that of protection and keeping moist. Bone, usually white and hard unless necrotic. Management strategy is to promote granulation to form over the bone and prevent infection. Exudate level is critically important when selecting dressing materials for use beneath compression, especially so for venous leg ulcers and the dressing change wear time expectation. Exudate level descriptors have varied significantly from the use of words and plus, plus, plus signs. The following level descriptors have been published aiming to achieve consistency in recording and reporting exudate levels more accurately. Dry, no visible moisture, not an ideal wound healing environment except in the ischemic wound which we aim to keep dry. The surrounding skin may be dry, flaky and hyperkeratotic. Moist, this is an ideal wound environment. Dressings may be lightly marked, the wound bed could appear glossy and the surrounding skin may be intact and hydrated. Wet, primary dressing may be extensively marked. There's a potential for the start of peri-wound maceration. Saturated, free fluid is visible. Primary dressing is now wet and leakage is visible on the secondary dressing. Strike through may occur. Risk of macerated peri wound skin at this stage. Leaking. Free fluid is visible. Dressings are saturated with leaking of exudate from primary and secondary dressings. Very high risk of peri wound maceration and excoriation. Exudate type descriptors have also been published. These include consistency, colour and clinical significance. When selecting dressing materials, it is important to ensure that the consistency of wound exudates can be effectively managed as some dressing materials are unable to absorb more viscous types of exudate. Serous exudate is normally thin, watery, clear, straw coloured. This is often considered to be normal, but increased volumes may indicate infection, such as Staphylococcus aureus, may also be due to fluid from urinary or lymphatic fistula. Fibrinous, this is normally thin, watery and cloudy, may indicate the presence of fibrin strands, which could indicate a response to inflammation. Serosanguinous, this is thin, slightly thicker than water, clear and pink. The presence of red blood cells indicates capillary damage, for example, after surgery or a traumatic dressing removal. Sanguinous, thin, watery, reddish, low protein content due to venous or congestive cardiac disease, malnutrition or enteric or urinary fistula. Purulent. This is normally viscous and sticky, opaque, milky yellow or brown, and sometimes even green. White blood cells, bacteria, slough from enteric or urinary fistula. Bacterial infection, for example, pseudomonas. Hemopurulent, viscous, reddish, but milky. Established infection may contain neutrophils, dying bacteria, inflammatory cells, blood leakage due to dermal capillaries and some bacteria. Hemorrhagic, this is viscous and dark red. Capillaries break down easily and bleed due to infection or trauma. Infection prevention and management. As discussed when we looked at differential diagnosis of leg ulcers, both venous and mixed leg ulcers are prone to infection. Venous leg ulcers are prone to recurrent infection episodes. This may be due to unmanaged exudate, dressing leakage, soiling from incontinence. Pseudomonas infection prevalence has also been on the increase. 
Some consider this to be related to the use of tap water during cleansing of the limb. Infection is destructive to tissue, enlarging the wound, and wound healing will not progress until the tissue is infection free. Chronicity may lead to biofilm development and a stalled wound. Sometimes wounds just suddenly stall. There may be no visible signs of infection present. Maybe a shiny surface can be seen on the wound. These factors could be an indication of biofilm. The biofilm is very difficult to diagnose unless a tissue biopsy is taken, which is often avoided due to enlarging the wound we are aiming to heal. So what is a biofilm? As you can see in the illustration, stage one shows how the bacteria initially adheres itself to the wound. Stage two shows early attachment to the surface. This is irreversible attachment at this stage and bacterial division has commenced. Stage three is the young biofilm being formed. A micro colony has been formed with cell to cell interaction. Essentially, the bacteria have made a protective barrier to reproduce beneath. And this poses a challenge for antimicrobials to penetrate and kill the bacteria. Stage four, you can see the mature biofilm. It's now a mushroom shaped, usually polymicrobial. The mature biofilm is increasingly resistant and difficult to eliminate with antimicrobials and even antibiotics. At stage five, you can see that the biofilm disperses itself and commences what we call a reseeding process. This cycle then starts again. There is a growing body of evidence for antimicrobials, which have the ability to penetrate the micro colony and kill the bacteria within the biofilm. Once established, a wound infection often requires systemic antibiotics which is what we aim to avoid. So early identification and topical antimicrobial treatment is crucial to prevent infection, establishment and reduce antibiotic use. Antimicrobial dressings are frequently used in clinical wound management for both infection prevention in those patients known to have recurrent episodes of infection and in the management of early diagnosed local wound infection. Characteristics of an ideal dressing. Over the decades, there have been many published lists of the characteristics of an ideal dressing. These include being capable of maintaining a high humidity for moist wound healing at the wound site, whilst removing excess exudate, so essentially maintaining good moisture balance. To be free from particles and toxic wound contaminants to be non-toxic and non-allergenic, to be capable of protecting the wound from further trauma, to be removed without causing further trauma to the wound or to the surrounding skin, to be impermeable to bacteria, to be thermally insulating to allow sound renewal and growth, to allow gaseous exchange, to be comfortable and conformable, to require only infrequent changes, thus making it cost effective, to have a long shelf life. We will now explore in the next slide some essential characteristics for dressings being used beneath compression therapy. The characteristics of an ideal dressing set out in the previous slide do apply, but there are some additional considerations for dressing materials used beneath compression therapy. And these may include the effectiveness of the materials when used beneath compression. So it does not release exudate back down to the wound when it's compressed, or the dressing does not require to swell to manage fluid and would the efficacy be reduced if it was unable to swell beneath compression. We talked about having multiple wounds and circumferential wounds. So what we want are sizes and shapes available to manage these types of wounds for clinical cost efficacy. Our wear time expectation 
If we expect our patient to be in compression therapy for seven days, then we need dressing materials that are durable enough to last seven days beneath the compression. This is important for clinical cost efficacy and also maybe for reimbursement. We want dressings that are able to de-slough and debride devitalized tissue whilst compression therapy is in place. We want to maintain a moist wound healing environment to promote healthy cell growth and migration. Absorbency and fluid handling capabilities. So being able to manage different levels and different consistencies of wound exudate. We want to prevent peri-wound complications through the movement of excess exudate. So we want to have a protective barrier. Antimicrobial efficacy. We need antimicrobials that will manage local wound infections, that will have the ability to penetrate and eliminate biofilms and prevention strategies for reinfection. We need our dressings to be durable during wear, not move beneath the compression or shred beneath the compression, not create hot spots, which could then lead to further skin damage and pressure damage to the patient's skin beneath the compression. We need the dressings to be conformable, comfortable for the patient. We want them to be low profile, lightweight. The patient's limbs are already fairly heavy when they're edematous. And we also want dressings that allow a non-traumatic removal. Another important consideration uh, due to staff turnover and training issues is that we actually want products that are easy to use, easy to train, easy to adopt into clinical practice. Dressing categories include semi-permeable film dressings, wound contact layers and advanced wound contact layers, gauze, soft cloth, foam, silicone foams, super absorbent, hydrocolloid, hydrofiber, gelling fibers and carboxymethicellulose, hydrogels, alginate, antimicrobial, collagen. There are many more advanced technologies and innovations. Dressings are generally categorized by their material type. Some newer or combination innovations are less easily placed within these categories. We will look at some of the categories most commonly used beneath compression therapy shortly. At this point, it is important to note that this module is not intended to be a comprehensive dressings and wound healing module, and the dressings are discussed in relation to their use beneath compression therapy only. Millican does aim to launch a comprehensive wound healing and dressing training academy module series in the future. Tissue protection, wound and advanced wound contact layers. These are frequently used beneath compression at different stages of the wound healing process used for protection and also as a carrier for active agents to be delivered to the wound bed. They can be single layer woven or non-woven materials or silicone wound contact layers. They are designed to protect fragile and new wound tissue. They can be perforated or permeable, allowing exudate to pass through into a secondary dressing. Combined layer wound contact layers with an absorbent layer behind to capture the exudate. They may be low adherent or non-adherent advanced wound contact layers. This will be dependent upon the materials and construction. Innovative new generation advanced wound contact layers have the ability to direct wound fluids away, maintain moisture balance at the wound bed whilst providing a one-way street to prevent excess fluids being pushed back towards the skin and the wound. Exudate management foam dressings. Foam dressings are sheets or shaped foamed polymer solutions, most commonly polyurethane usually having small open cells capable of holding fluids. Some cell construction differs between different manufacturers' foam dressings. 
Some foam dressings may be infused with active agents or layered in combination with other materials and agents. Fluid handling capability and absorption will depend on the contact layer, the foam thickness and composition and the outer cover film moisture vapour transmission rate. Foam dressings can be used when there is an active infection and beneath compression therapy. In addition, foam dressings which do not contain any actives are compatible with active cleansing, debriding and topical agents. It is also important to note that some dressings visually look like foam dressings but are unique in nature. These are multifunctional polymeric membrane dressings designed to facilitate healing, relieve pain and reduce inflammation via its polyurethane matrix and mild wound cleanser, soothing moisturiser, absorbent and a semi-permeable film backing. The polymem dressing seen on the slide is an example of this and must not be mistaken for a traditional foam dressing. When it comes to managing exudate beneath compression, several dressing options are available. Carboxymethacellulose hydrofiber, alginate, superabsorbance, which we will cover shortly. Negative pressure wound therapy can also be used beneath compression therapy. This is primarily to vascularize the wound bed to prepare for either healing or grafting whilst effectively managing exudate. Foam dressings are, however, frequently used beneath compression therapy to manage excess wound exudate whilst maintaining a moist wound healing environment. Adhesive and non-adhesive versions are available. These can be a soft gentle silicone or an adhesive agent. Adhesive versions are often used for protection at the phase of transition from bandages to stockings to protect the newly healed wound and not routinely used beneath compression bandages. Non-adhesive versions are normally selected for use beneath compression. Border or borderless considerations beneath compression. This relates to edema accumulation and the maintenance of skin integrity. Some foam dressings will have a lower profile border, and I'm not talking about the adhesive bordered dressings, but some foam dressings, non-adhesive versions, may taper off at the edges to avoid edema accumulation beneath compression. A range of sizes and shapes being available for specific body contours, such as the heel. These are used beneath compression therapy. Fluid handling and absorption is dependent on the foam composition and thickness, but also relates to the exudate type and behaviour of the foam beneath compression, such as an open cell foam when used beneath compression, potentially reducing its ability to take up fluid. Fluid retainment is also dependent on the foam construction and its ability to retain fluid when compression is applied over. Is it safely transferred away or locked away within the foam cells? Or is it able to be pushed back toward the wound and peri-wound healthy skin when used under compression? Overall, moisture vapour transmission rate will be dependent on the dressing's outer film cover, moisture vapour transmission capabilities, and the moisture vapour transmission capabilities of the compression materials applied over. Essentially, we desire both to complement each other in having high moisture vapour transmission rates. Exudate management, hydrofiber, gel in fibre and alginate type dressings. These dressings aim to manage exudate and correct wound bed tissue type, such as assisting autolytic debridement. Hydrofiber dressings, also known as CMC or carboxymethacellulose dressings. These are very popular and frequently used beneath compression therapy, especially so in the venous leg ulcer patient to manage excess exudate levels. 
Silver versions are also available and are frequently used in leg ulcer patients. They are also reported in the literature as sometimes being overused. These dressings have high absorption and rapid gelling. They require a secondary dressing, a gauze or a pad beneath the compression. Dressing integrity is maintained through newer design features, such as a weave of thread in some of the hydrofiber brands. Referred to as bacteria trapping and able to modulate destructive proteases at the wound bed, with the silver version also being cited as able to address biofilm. We will be covering this shortly. Ideally, we want the dressing to remain gelled and in intimate contact with the wound bed to aid autolysis and promote cell renewal in a moist wound healing environment. The dressing may stick if exudate levels suddenly diminish during wear, which can happen beneath effective compression therapy or effective antimicrobial therapy. This will require irrigation to regel the dressing and ensure non-traumatic removal. Alginate dressings. Alginates are less frequently used beneath compression since the development of hydrofiber gelling fiber dressings. Alginates have high absorption, some hemostatic properties and are slower gelling. The gelling will depend upon the fibre content of the alginate, so the percentage of manuronic and gluronic acid. You will see these referred to as M and G fibres in alginates. Autolytic debridement is further assisted by a sodium calcium ion exchange, which takes place between the alginate dressing and the exudate. Two of the main drawbacks with alginate dressings is one, that of the loss of integrity through over gelling in high volumes of exudate and two, drying out and becoming difficult to remove when exudate levels diminish. Due to the non-rapid gelling when irrigated, this can take more time and be more difficult to remove from the wound bed. New innovations in hybrid gelling fibre dressings using textile materials such as bamboo are newly available and have a specific structural design to provide gelled fibrils whilst managing fluctuating levels of wound exudate. Exudate management superabsorbent dressings. These have become increasingly popular beneath compression therapy, aiming to extend bandage wear times to the maximum of seven days. They are highly absorbent materials with fluid retention capability. They do not all behave in the same way in terms of fluid handling and fluid holding. Not all superabsorbers are the same. They are made with a variety of different materials and manufacturing techniques. Some are carboxymethacellulose, cottons, rayons. An important consideration is if the superabsorbent is a dressing or a pad. One question that always arises is where should I place the superabsorbent? Under the compression, between the compression, over the compression. For those superabsorbents that are superabsorbent dressings, it is critically important that they are placed in direct contact with the wound bed to be effective. Low adherent, the dressing superabsorbers have a low adherent wound contact layer and are safe to put in intimate contact with the wound bed. We also need to consider swell level of some of the products. This is usually the superabsorbent pads rather than dressings. Effectiveness may be disrupted beneath compression or increased pressure hotspots may risk skin damage, complete bandage or dressing failure. Dressing weight must also be considered beneath compression therapy. The patient may already find that their limb has become increasingly heavy and uncomfortable due to their underlying chronic venous insufficiency and edema. The additional weight of fluid retaining dressings and superabsorbent pads may further affect this and decrease the patient's ability to mobilise effectively.
tissue management, debridement of devitalized tissue, mechanical debridement. We no longer subject our patients to the painful and traumatic method of wet to dry dressings. However, sometimes this does happen unintentionally. If a dressing has adhered, always irrigate to rehydrate and wait as long as it takes to remove. Hydrocolloid dressing use was once very popular, but became increasingly unpopular beneath compression therapy due to reports of dressing leakage, surrounding skin damage and the foul odour consistently being reported by patients during wear. Plus, newer innovations in dressings becoming available to achieve the debridement objectives has evolved this practice. Hydrogel is often used in conjunction with a cover dressing, a gauze and a film for rapid autolytic debridement. Some hydrogels are 90 to 98% water-based carboxymethacellulose gel, able to hydrate devitalized tissue quickly and effectively when beneath a semi-permeable film. Hydrofiber and alginate dressings. We've previously explored these for surface slough and fibrin management. Chemical and enzymatic debridement agents are very effective when used by specialist practitioners. These are less popular in routine leg ulcer management. Sharp debridement is performed if the blood supply is sufficient and the tissue volume is present. It's usually avoided over bone. Larva therapy may also be used beneath compression. Excellent results are seen. This sometimes happens naturally in hot weather or hot climates. Larva therapy requires the patient to be on board and acceptant of a live debridement method. Polyhexamethylene biguanide, usually referred to as PHMB, dressings are now being more commonly used. There are a variety of dressing materials and solutions utilising this broad spectrum antimicrobial biocide due to its effectiveness on bacteria, fungi, parasites and certain viruses. Honey-based dressings have been less frequently used beneath compression due to a fear of the osmotic effect increasing wound exudate level. If the antimicrobial is being effective against the bacteria, and the compression is being effective for the edema and underlying chronic venous insufficiency, the exudate level should remain under control even when honey-based products are being used. Odour control in the presence of infection is crucial. The antimicrobial will eventually kill the bacteria and eliminate the source of the odour. However, there will be a need for odour controlling dressings until the infection itself is brought under control. There are many dressings available on the market to help eliminate the presence of odour, such as those containing cyclodextrin or activated carbon, which aims to bind bacteria and eliminate the odour. It is important to consider some products remain active in wet conditions and others do not. So care should be taken when selecting odour control dressings for the use in exuding leg ulcers. Antimicrobial and active dressing considerations. Leg ulcers may frequently require antimicrobial dressing management due to the risk of infection, with some patients presenting with multiple episodes of infection during their healing journey. Antimicrobial objective is to prevent or treat infection. We do not want to overuse antimicrobials and risk the increase of microbial resistance. However, some patients will require preventative antimicrobials if they have a history of recurrent wound infection. The objective of antimicrobials is to locally treat the early infection to prevent the patient requiring systemic antibiotics. Antimicrobial type, mode of delivery and mode of action are key considerations beneath compression therapy. Is the antimicrobial dressing a barrier or does it actively interact with the wound bed to eliminate bacteria? 
antimicrobial and active dressing considerations. Leg ulcers may frequently require antimicrobial dressing management due to the risk of infection, with some patients presenting with multiple episodes of infection during their healing journey. Antimicrobial objective is to prevent or treat infection. We do not want to overuse antimicrobials and risk the increase of microbial resistance. However, some patients will require preventative antimicrobials if they have a history of recurrent wound infection. The objective of antimicrobials is to locally treat the early infection to prevent the patient requiring systemic antibiotics. Antimicrobial type, mode of delivery and mode of action are key considerations beneath compression therapy. Is the antimicrobial dressing a barrier or does it actively interact with the wound bed to eliminate bacteria? Antimicrobial mode of action must align to compression change, such as release of antimicrobial throughout the duration of compression wear and maintenance of a kill rate. Visual observations of the wound is not possible beneath compression. Therefore, change frequency will need to be increased during episodes of infection. This is usually one to three days. Silver dressings are commonly used and have been subject to overuse in some countries. Not all silver dressings are the same, so it is important to understand the type and its delivery mechanism. Skin care principles beneath compression. Cleansing. It is essential that the full lower limb is washed, usually with tap water at each bandage change and not just the wound area itself being cleansed. Essentially, we need to reduce the general microbial load on the skin, prevent infection and also help to exfoliate any surface dead skin cells where microbes may lurk. Some patients unfortunately are told not to wash their limb for the duration of their compression therapy, which can also have effects on their quality of life and social well-being. There are newly available clinical wipes and debridement pads which aid the cleansing and exfoliating of the skin in preparation for compression to be applied. When the limb has been gently dried, the wound area can then be cleansed with saline or a prescribed active cleansing agent as per local policy, guideline and patient care pathway. Dryness. If the skin is allowed to dry out and form cracks, it will become open to microorganism infiltration. This risks cellulitis development and further wounds. Gold standard to avoid the skin drying is usually to apply an emollient. It is important to consider the effectiveness of any emollient beneath compression therapy. Its compatibility with layer one materials being applied directly over in terms of affecting the emollient being absorbed by the skin. We will look at the treatment options for other skin conditions related to chronic venous insufficiency next. Eczema. There are different treatment pathways for different severities of eczema. In the case of a severe eczema flare-up, initiation of your local topical steroid treatment pathway will be required. Medicated bandages such as zinc or calamine based are used to manage the symptoms of eczema, skin conditioner and itch relief. Usually following two to three weeks use of medicated bandage in early diagnosed, not severe eczema, excellent results can be obtained. It is important to also remember that medicated bandages such as zinc and calamine can also be used whilst topical steroid treatment is in progress. Maceration. This will occur if excess wound exudate is left unmanaged, especially if compression bandages become wet and are left in situ for several days. Management with excellent fluid handling dressing materials and peri-wound protection will resolve this and prevent further maceration from occurring. Excoriation. This will occur due to chronic wound exudates being corrosive in nature to healthy skin. 
the use of excellent fluid handling dressings and skin barrier where appropriate not applied on excoriated tissue will prevent further damage occurring. Also, paste bandages such as zinc or calamine can be used to soothe the corrosive irritation and resolve this skin damage. Allergy. Leg ulcer patients are known to be a highly sensitive population. The use of non-latex gloves and materials Allergy history checks for sensitivities to previous dressings, compression materials and always to observe for signs of sensitivity at every dressing change. Trauma. Skin trauma can occur due to pressure, friction, shear, excess fluids such as exudate, lymphatic fluids, urine, adhesives. Ensure compression materials are applied correctly to reduce any pressure, friction and shear. Manage wound exudate and aim for non-adherent, non-traumatic dressings and devices to avoid additional skin trauma. In summary, we have revisited the size and cost of the leg ulcer problem globally and touched on wound and skin care considerations for this population. Differential diagnosis, we have discussed some of the different wound dressing challenges and needs for both venous and mixed leg ulcer patients. Wound prevention and history, we have looked at dressing considerations relating to wound size, shape, location and responses to previously deployed treatment. We have explored the World Union of Wound Healing Societies and Wounds UK published descriptors and recommended management for tissue types, exudate levels and exudate types. We have touched on bioburden and infection, identification, management and prevention of wound infection, biofilm development and challenges when considering antimicrobial and antibiotic use. Dressing principles. We have looked at published characteristics of an ideal dressing, further considerations for dressings to be used beneath compression, dressing categories and touched on some dressing categories for use beneath compression. Wound contact layers, foam dressings, gel and fibre dressings, alginates and superabsorbent dressings. We have looked at methods of wound debridement and where dressing materials are pivotal to wound bed preparation. Finally, we have explored antimicrobial and active agent dressing considerations for use beneath compression. Thank you for completing module four, Wound Management Principles with Compression Therapy of the Millican Healthcare Compression Training Academy. There are five additional modules in this Compression Academy series. Module one, leg ulcers and conditions affecting the lower limb. This module explores lower limb physiology, assessment, investigation and venous leg ulcer differential diagnosis. Module two, understanding compression therapy. This module explores how compression works, the theory and science of compression, compression types, characteristics of an ideal compression, selection of compression and patient benefits. Module three, compression therapy in practice, compares various bandage material application methods, ease of use, ease of training, patient safety and competency. How to correctly apply, how to achieve and sustain desired levels of compression. Module five, this module supports home care practice, patient information and patient care advice materials for looking after compression at home, preventing recurrence, skin management, diet, exercise and hosiery. Module six, this module provides clinical evidence summaries to support your compression practice and how to set up and run a clinical evaluation with a data template example. Thank you, Claire, for another great presentation. Attendees, we will not be doing the live Q&A portion since we have rolled over five minutes into your day, so I apologize in advance for that. I see that we have a few questions that have come through. We will treat it like we did for module three, and if 
with the email response provide the questions with answers. I've listed here on the screen our website and our email. If you have any questions that we did not or were not able to answer during this time, please feel free to send them to that email and we'll make sure to include any responses or concerns that you may have. Thank you all. The Milliken team will be responding and following up with after this webinar, so we'll be in touch. And Claire, thank you again for the information packed presentation today. Uh, a follow up email, like I said, will be coming your way containing information regarding the next module to sign up for in this Compression Training Academy series, along with the questions and answers that we were not able to get to today. Don't worry, the next session we'll make sure to have a live Q&A, but thank you again for your time and have a good rest of your day.